Hello and welcome to the Stand Up With Me, Dominic, Midterm Elections Analysis Extravaganza. Step up, step in, and learn what we know so far from the great midterm elections. Joining me today from CNN, John Avlon. Fordham University's Dr. Chrissy Greer. And for the first time from Next Gen America, here to explain the importance of the youth vote, it's Antonio Aralano. Welcome, welcome, and thank you very much for joining me. This is part one of the Stand Up with Pete Dominic Midterm Analysis Extravaganza. That's the name that we workshop. A lot of people weighed in on that. Surprisingly, that is the one. <laughs> that is the one that our fake focus group chose. And on tomorrow, I'm going to do a part two because I talked to so many people over the last 24 hours. I'm going to do a part two with the brilliant Dahlia Lithwick, David Daly, and Noel Kasler joining me. So today we've got John Avalon, Chrissy Greer, and Antonio Arellano. Arellano. I don't know how to say it the proper name he was awesome great conversation with him for the first time and tomorrow part two so i'll drop it on a saturday you can listen to it anytime over the weekend because you need the downloads i took a week off and i wanted to give you another show but also you want the downloads for the month it's a whole podcast metric thing and i'm just playing catch up now but thank you to everybody who supported the time off and so people are so nice and Really, really thoughtful with all of your comments. I get very nervous about taking time off that people are going to ban and ship that are going to cancel their subscription because we're down. Everybody's down. But across the board, it would seem from The Washington Post right down to stand up with Pete Dominic. But if you don't have a paid subscription, now would be a great time to get one. Sign up for as little as five bucks and you can be a part of our community. Support this independent show. Have your voice heard. Let me know who you want to hear. Be a part of our community. We meet up every Thursday night. We've got a 24-7 Discord channel and so much more. Help produce the show on the Stand Up Street team, which anybody can still join. There's a lot to be had for as little as five bucks. You can always edit your subscription upwards. So many of you have done that as well. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining me today. I'm going to jump right in with CNN's John Avlon, who I caught up with for the first time yesterday. He had a lot to say. We have a little bit of a disagreement about the issue regarding how crime was portrayed. And I pushed back on him on that. We had a great conversation about it. He is thoughtful and brilliant as always. I was very happy he joined me on Twitter at John Avlon. You can watch him on CNN where he's a senior political analyst and anchor. Host their reality check segment and check out his new book, Lincoln and the Fight for Peace. John Avlon starts right now. John, welcome to the midterm extravaganza. You were like top, top choice for me. Thank you for joining me here. Oh, brother. Listen, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. We've got a lot to talk about. Yeah, I've been watching you on the on the CNN. I've been reading you on the CNN.com opinion and, and hearing what you're saying and, and thinking about the results of the election. What went wrong in terms of predictions, in terms of polling, in terms of media's interpretation or the public's interpretation of polling, in terms of all this anticipation for a, a bigger red wave, red tsunami, what do you, what do you think uh, went wrong in the analysis? Well, I think you know the, the pollsters may have tried to overcorrect for their under accounting of Republicans in the past. That's possible, but that's going to be a question for pollsters. And I think there's a perfectly reasonable need for a, a post mortem on that. I think um, you know narratives uh, take on their own life uh, based on expectations and obviously polling. For me, I, I was really focused in the last week of the election on uh, on the early vote, because I kept seeing that this, you know, this historic early vote that was exceeding 2018 and even 2020 uh, levels in some places. And uh, and I, I was just saying, you know, gosh, how does this skew? I mean, we should be spending, I think, more time as journalists, as, as citizens, as observers looking at that, because those are real <laughs> that's real votes, right? And that's real data, not, you know, polls of, you know, future predicted behavior. And so I think as early voting becomes more and more common, I, I think analyzing that with the sort of intensity usually directed at polling would be a a, a good improvement uh, to the, the system writ large. I, I also think 
you know, as I wrote for CNN, it's the extremism, stupid. Right. I mean, the economy matters, of course. But I think people were denigrating Joe Biden for uh, arguing that democracy was also on the ballot. But that is indeed literally the case when you have election deniers running to be governor, running to be secretaries of state. And I think when you look a lot of the not top line polling about, you know, right direction, wrong direction in America, I, I think we don't do an adequate job of saying what are what are the inputs? You know, we just think it's 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 a negative verdict on the president uh, at that particular time. Right. But, you know, it could be people saying, you know, hey, I'm really concerned that uh, there's a, a group of people in this country who uh, refuse to accept reality. And and as I said, I think, you know, election denialism is uniquely dangerous because democracy depends on an assumption of goodwill. And 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 Trump's election denial crew don't have that clearly. It, it depends on 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 a same a common set of facts. So we can reason together. I think it blows that up as well, obviously. So um, I, I, and, and, and just the, the January 6th of it all. So inflation mm. matters. Crime matters. Uh, don't you take those things for granted. But don't dismiss democracy as something that people I'm, will want to protect. I'm hung up on democracy depends on goodwill. And I'd love to spend another 18 hours or read uh, your sure. next article about that, because it's such a really interesting point. But you talk about extremism. You talked about uh, some of the causes didn't mention uh, abortion, but obviously that was at play. What changes now in terms of uh, the the mindset of voters for the next election? What have you seen in terms of data uh, to prove the point about extremism, which I always thought would be uh, the case? You wrote a great piece about it. What do you think changes in terms of that extremism for the upcoming cycle, for the Republican Party even? Well, well I, I think one of the things that had people really bracing is that obviously, you know, <laughs> politicians are going to make decisions based on on what what they think works. Right. And, and, you know, this is too often we hear, uh, you know, the few number of politicians in swing districts talk about the need to come together and meet in the middle. And then if they're from, you know, uh, you know a, a, a bright red district, they're like, well, you know, I'm, I'm not here to compromise. I'm here to, you know, I'm going to have their own language about holding you know, the parties to account, whatever. But uh, it, it's really driven by short term self-interest, most of our politics. And, and we frankly need a lot more long term thinking in our politics. But putting that aside, I, I think the fact that a lot of the election deniers did badly, um, that it was not the red wave that people anticipated. Um, but, you know, for, Kentucky voted down an, an abortion amendment. Uh, which is extraordinary. Right. Um, that hopefully that will finally give more Republicans courage to do what many say in private, which is to stand up to Donald Trump and 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 the the election denial lies that he has you know fostered inside the political party, and that's been enabled by politicians who haven't had the courage to call them what they are because the election lie litmus test is the best way to win a, a partisan primary in the Republican Party. Um, yeah. And that's still probably true, but it's a terrible way to win a general election. And that's why I think we also got to watch, you know, what's happening in Arizona and Nevada very closely, because those are uh, really prominent, important I I I examples of, of this stuff. So it's not over yet. Let's I, we forget. I saw you mention this on CNN. Also, you mentioned this in your article at CNN. The big question was whether the GOP nominating outright election deniers would matter to voters faced with more immediate issues like inflation and concerns about crime. Those are real and urgent concerns. I want to just slightly push back on that only specifically sure. here in New York 23, where I live, John, which was redistricted. I'll talk with David Daly yep. later on about that. Sean Patrick oh, Maloney loses to a Republican, Mark Lawler, who pushed that crime narrative over and over. But here's the thing, John, just like CRT, Glenn Youngkin won on CRT, then shut down the hotline that parents had uh, set up to use that he'd set up for parents to call in to report CRT because it wasn't a thing. It wasn't a thing in the campaign. It was always a lie. So is crime. I live in you New know, York 23. I don't know anybody who knows anybody who knows anybody who was a victim of crime. It was always a false narrative on like one statistic about homicide in the city, the bail reform issue, which nobody even knows about. But most importantly, John Rockland County, New York 23, Third safest uh -huh. county in America. We don't have a crime issue mm -hmm. here, and yet he ran on it, and they won, and it's not a thing. What do you think? I I I, I, I think you're 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 missing the point. Okay. Um. First of all, I mean, there's a huge. There was a red wave in the New York suburbs. 
And I've spoken to a lot of, of, of the Democrats who are running about what happened and why. I mean, the fact that Sean Patrick Maloney lost is stunning. The fact that the DCCC lose is stunning. Now, let's look about, first of all, the foundational thing that made the uh, the suburbs uh, possible to, to, to for Republicans to win is the fact that Democrats got greedy in their redistricting. They tried to do what Republicans do in other states like Florida and Texas and Ohio. But the judges in New York state, many of whom were Democrats, originally said this is not consistent with, you know, the, the independent redistricting uh, that, you know, commissions that have been passed by voters. Right. And then they acted expeditiously, unlike <laughs> Ohio and Florida uh, and Texas. And, and, and you know, they had an independent auditor come in and, and create these fra- fairer districts um, that all of a sudden, you know, it, it's a case of overreach on the part of the Democrats part. They didn't need to happen. They, they you know, as, as one Democrat told me, you know, pigs get fed, hogs get slaughtered. And, and that created the conditions. Now, uh, Kathy Hochul, I've also heard, you know, the top the ticket, the governor was really focused on winning the vote by focusing on getting voter high voter turnout in the city and didn't spend as much time competing for the suburbs, which left them to sort of, you know, for Zeldin and Republicans to make the play. Elections are about the suburbs. And, you know, my politics generally. Right. You want to win the center. You want to win the middle. You don't want to simply play to the base. And suburbs are a geographic representation of that fact. Now, on the crime issue. Um, so it's not about crime in Rockland County. And I, I, I almost think that should be obvious. No, suburbs have very low crime in general, right? Um, it, it, it's, it's about perceptions of rising crime in New York, which are true. Starting in 20, 2020, we had a massive rise nationally in murders, like a 30% spike, unheard of, after decades of crime decline. Now, in New York, actually, homicides are down this year, but other crimes are up. And 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 the uh, and, and that creates a sense of lawlessness, particularly when people in suburbs go into New York City and feel New York City as a proxy for their their area. Um, and, and the bail reform laws that were initially passed in New York um, were exponentially worse than, say, your, your neighbors in New Jersey, um, in part because New York is the only state in the country where judges don't have the discretion literally the only state in the country where judges can't take into account dangerousness. And while Kathy Hochul did get some bail reform put through, Democrats didn't lean in on the issue, which is what people expect when they feel unsafe. And yes, you could say it's a matter of perception. It's also a matter of statistics in in, in places, not in Rockland County. But uh, it's an issue that moves people. My macro point was, hey, Democrats shouldn't ignore crime. you got to lean into it because that's the baseline that people expect. I think quality of life matters, crime matters, et cetera. But that also... You know, we can't make decisions on always urgent but short term priorities. Democracy is foundational. Right. If you elect an election denier because he says, I'm going to fix crime and inflation, they're not actually going to fix crime and inflation. Right. The Fed fixes inflation um, and, and crime is, is, is a state and local issue, not usually dealt with in Congress unless they're going to pass a new crime bill with lots of money for new police and police tree training, which, you know, they probably won't do. So, you know, that's why democracy, I think, should be at the top of people's minds when it comes to election deniers. But I think Democrats make a big mistake when they say what you're perceiving and what you're seeing in the city isn't happening because it is. OK, final question then is about exit polling, what you learned in terms of oh, man. who mattered. It seems like I'll be talking to someone on the youth vote. I'm hearing a lot about Gen Z. I'm hearing and seeing. Are you want to uh, react to that or any other voting demographic so, that surprised you so, or didn't? So, again, I think everything's on the foundation of very high early vote turnout, which is great, right? You know, p- part of the part of what people bank on is, oh, you know, midterm elections are going to be low turnout, high intensity, tending towards more extreme voters. You know, therefore, we don't need to play to the middle. But if you get a representative turnout of the electorate, you get a representative election. And that's what we want. And that also means young people have to show up in greater percentages than they typically do. Typically, you know, under 30 turnout in midterms is like 20 percent. In 2018, it was 35 percent. We're going to see what the final numbers are. But that, that's really important. The exit poll stats that really blew my mind, and CNN has a great page that people should look at. First of all, and you know this because I'm always focusing on what independent voters are doing. Independent voters went for Democrats narrowly by two points, 49 to 47. That is unheard of in midterm elections. Mm. Independents always, in, in recent history, going back decades, tend to swing to the party out of power, usually right. by double digits. And it's usually an independent sense of, well, we need to balance one party rule you know, want to check on the president. And by the way, you know, divided government doesn't need a check and balance anymore. It usually means dysfunction and demonization. But we can discuss that, you know, further <laughs> in a later day. Right. 
Um, but but um, and that's unfortunate. Um, but the fact that independent voters went two percent uh, for for uh, Democrats, not Republicans, is stunning. It's it, and I, that to me is the key insight of the election um, uh, that drives a lot. Repu- Democrats won moderate voters uh, handily. That's less of a surprise. Interestingly, Republicans won suburbs. Um, and typically those two things kind of go in tandem. So that's one of the pieces that I want to dig into more to understand. But also, if you look at the exit polling, you know, with CNN found that you know, the, the, the country, for example, vastly more likely to say that immigrants, uh, you know, help our country, don't hurt it. You know, uh, you look at what happened in Kentucky. I mean, all yeah. five of the ballot initiatives um, on, on, on abortion, you know, it was codified in, in, in Michigan. But an attempt to sort of further restrict and ban in, in, in Kentucky was voted down following Kansas's lead a while ago. So I, I think, you know, keeping in mind the important and the urgent um, is difficult to do in life and in newsrooms. But I think the voters did that this year. And that's 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 a good, healthy thing for, for our democracy. And I think the fact that Donald Trump now uh, looks as weak as he, in fact, always has been uh, may. I want to stress may cause more Republicans to have courage to stand up to. Him. Yeah, we will see. I want to talk to you. A lot uh, listen, more about brother, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. The thing I was watching you on the, on the TV just now. What is it with your skin? What do you have a lotion? Is it genetic? What do you mean? You're such good skin. I, I'm, you know, thank my grandparents for coming here. For oh, you don't race. have, don't th- you're just saying, you're telling me right now there's no kind of a uh, uh, regime. I, I do not have a skincare regimen. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. All right. This is just, this is just me, baby. Well, you look very good. You continue to look well, very you. good. You sound very good. I appreciate you joining me so much. All right, there he goes, John Avalon. Go say hello to him on Twitter. It's been too long since I talked with John, and I'd love for you to let him know that you heard him here and appreciated it. Now let's move on to a scholar, a Ph.D., an associate professor of political science at Fordham University. You've seen her plenty of times on MSNBC. She's the host of The Blackest Questions on the Grio and co-host of FAQ. NYC, one of my all-time favorite people to talk to. Awesome to catch up with my friend Chrissy Greer, or to you, Dr. Christina Greer at dr underscore cm greer on Twitter. Chrissy, let's do it. Okay, now I have her. There she is, and I'm very excited to have her in our all-star list. The midterm extravaganza here on Stand Up. Like she hasn't commented on you didn't even sleep for the last 36 hours. So thank you for joining me. I'm always happy to be here. Always. Lots of storylines to talk about, but can we talk about the white women of Georgia first? Talk about what? them. I mean, the numbers are abysmal, you know, um, and every election cycle we get surprised. White women didn't vote democratically. White women aren't Democrats, y'all. Like we keep talking about this gender gap and it's because black women are so disproportionately Democratic. It makes it seem as though women are Democrats and men are Republicans, but they're not. White women and white men overwhelmingly voted for the Republican in the Georgia governor's race. And this whole nothing burger about black men don't support Stacey Abrams. Guess what? Like, yes. Did they support Stacey Abrams at the same rates as as black women? No. Did they support Stacey Abrams at the same exact rates that black women or that black men support Democratic candidates? Absolutely. So this idea, Killer Mike and his nonsensical non-analysis, putting up to, to Brian Kemp, you know, saying like, oh, black men don't support Stacey. They don't like Stacey. They, they haven't heard from her, which is all untruth. It's just the data doesn't bear it out. Black men supported Stacey. So guess who supported Stacey the most? Black women. Guess who supported Stacey second to that? Black men. That's the way the trends always are in the Democratic Party. That's the way they shook out for Stacey Abrams. And here we are. White women and white men behave the way they always behaved. And Brian Kemp is going to be the, the governor of Georgia. Yes. So some, I think I might have read 75 percent of white female voters in Georgia voted for the white guy and against the black woman. Yeah, that's fine. And that's what white women do. Like, I don't know why we get shocked every two to four years. Like, white women vote against their interests. It's like, well, you know, someone posted, it's like, are they voting against their interests? Or maybe they're voting for like, we have to ask ourselves what their interests are. Like patriarchy doesn't get upheld by men alone. <laughs> Neither does white supremacy. So, you know, I always tell people, it's like, you don't have to be white to support white supremacy. You don't have to be a man to support patriarchy. And there's a reason why white women as the protected class in this country consistently vote for, you know, sort of white nationalist white men. What about just the the, the way that uh, obviously Georgia and I've talked with David Daly about uh, being gerrymandered and making it hard to vote. There's been this having to prove this negative. But the fact that Brian Kemp got so much credit and applause for, you know, basically upholding his election and getting in a fight with Trump. 
was is infuriating because the dude is a terrible person yeah. for so many reasons and made it really hard to vote. And then that's the other narrative. If it was so hard to vote, then how many then why did so many black people vote, Chrissy? What about all that? Right. So he did one sort of decent thing, <laughs> which as a citizen of the United States, and he's been getting the credit ever since. So it makes him seem like he's not an Abbott or a DeSantis or a Youngkin. It's like, oh, you know, he, he sort of didn't let Trump steal the election from his state. So all of a sudden he's like this great savior of democracy, which is not the case. Like, don't forget, he has lawsuits from the Republican Party because they feel like he stole the primary in 2018 and when he was secretary of state. And that's basically like playing in the Super Bowl and your team is like, you know, not just the coaches, but the referees and everything else and people in charge of the equipment. I mean, that's he was literally in charge of the equipment for his own race. Like, make that make sense. So then it's just like, yeah, just because people voted, it's like they voted despite the fact that it was harder for them. They voted despite the fact that all these institutional barriers were set up to make it seem more difficult for black people to vote or people in particular communities, which coincidentally happen to be highly democratic or coincidentally happen to be highly black. So it's like just because you have good numbers, despite the institutional barriers, doesn't make it like applause worthy, Brian Kemp, at all. What about the now Georgia runoff? Herschel Walker versus Raphael Warnock. You're shaking your head before I've it's even finished to the question. disgusting and a sin and a shame. Because you know why? These white evangelicals double down on Herschel Walker. This is a man who has a long rap sheet of abuse. And when I say rap sheet, I'm meaning that specifically, right? Of putting guns to <laughs> guns, plural, yeah. to women's heads. You know, like just abuse, abortions, like, like Tic Tacs, right? And then you literally have a man of the cloth in Raphael Warnock and these white evangelicals are just like, well, no, we're going to go with with this dude here who is dumber than a bag of rocks, obviously. But also it just shows you it's like this is this is who the Republicans think black people are. Right. This is this is who they want. They don't want sort of a, a highly educated, thoughtful intellect in Senator Warnock who understands and is interested in policy and ideas. They want a. Heisman Trophy winner from four decades ago who can barely string together two sentences, who talks like mealy mouth nothingness, who clearly does not pass a moral, char- moral character test in any capacity. And that's who they're just like, yeah, this is our guy. We're just going to ignore all this other stuff. So you can take your white Christianity and shove it because it's just so embarrassing that Senator Warnock even has to go against someone who just is yeah. in no way, shape or form intellectually an equal or policy wise or character wise. But this is, you know, this is what the Republican Party thinks of black people, that this is who they they want to put up as uh, someone they leader. can control. I mean, listen, they're going to put that man, you know, if if God forbid he becomes a U.S. senator, it'll just be like, sign this, Herschel. OK, like go here, Herschel. OK, like the staffers will have the most power. And it's just like, right, we can do anything because this man will never question us. He'll never ask any anything in return. He's just happy to be there. And their biggest thing will be sort of trying to hide scandal after scandal because clearly he's, he's not mentally. uh, Can I hear your Herschel Walker impression one more time? Okay. (laughs) Okay. Let's, (laughs) let's move on to another issue, which is young people came out and vote and, and voted. And I've booked someone to talk about that. uh, Thanks to your tweet. And, and you know about young people, because you work with young people every day because you are a Ph.D. professor at Fordham College. So you're not surprised by this because but what do you think it is? What animated uh, your students or, or any other young folks around the country? So by and large, young people, you know, two to one voted for the Democratic Party. But, you know, for co- that's college educated students tend to vote democratically and non college educated students are Republican. Mm. That that makes sense. Right. We have to remember that, you know, a lot of people don't care about student debt if they're not in college, like it doesn't affect them. So the Democrats have to think about messaging if they're trying to get new people. It's like you're trying to get college educated new people or people with some college. Just be real about that, because the Charlottesville folks, even though a lot of them were in college, I mean, a lot of them were not. So when you're thinking about especially white voters, non-college, college aged, the Charlottesville voters, prote- the, 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 the racial. Charlottesville protesters. Yeah. Right. But the college aged kids who aren't in college are Republican. But kids who are in college, who by and large voted democratically, they care about the environment. 
Like they see these hurricanes. They want to live in cities, but they're like, will the city be underwater? Like I want to actually have freedom of movement, right? right. They are worried about being saddled with $100,000 in debt. And by the time they pay it off, it'll be $400,000 in debt. And women and men care about a woman's right to choose. Because I was like, listen, you know, I've talked to my students about this. I was like, let's play this scenario down to the hill. You get a girl pregnant. Republicans say life begins at inception. So can your girlfriend or the girl you hooked up with at a bar turn to you and say, I'm one month pregnant. Start these child support payments today. <laughs> and also, I don't really know you like that, but I am. I have to have this baby. So now for the next 18 years, minimum, plus the, the nine to 10 months that I'm carrying this kid, you are on the hook financially. I don't even know you. Right. But hey, if in for a penny, in for a pound, if we're doing this, like you're into it, too. So it's not just a woman and affecting her life. It's like so lawsuit after lawsuit. Pete, drag your ass into the courthouse because you now have a gaggle of kids because abortion is not possible. Right. So now all of a sudden guys are like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> like This isn't just women being shackled. It's like this is an economic endeavor that the Republicans don't believe in a social safety net. So there's not going to be any sort of good public schooling because ever since public schools, by and large, became majority kids of color, they've defunded it. And so they don't care about public schools. They don't care about the environment. Gun safety is out the window. So like now that you have these kids, you got to worry about them getting shot up in freaking kindergarten because Republicans won't actually, you know, protect them in the classroom. They want to give teachers guns. Do you realize every day I'm in that classroom, it's me versus the, the PowerPoint, and it is a struggle. <laughs> like, me on the laptop in the classroom, some semesters, like, depending on what classroom I'm in, I'm like, dear Lord, please guide me. I usually have, like, a tech kid where I'm like, sit up front, because we know Professor Greer is going to struggle with this computer. Your suggestion the- is you can't operate machinery and should not be issued a pistol? Don't give me a damn gun! I can barely get this internet PowerPoint up with the projector. The projector is always that's that is my nemesis. Well, those that, uh, that all of those nemesis. things are a lot uh, easier to use than guns. That's part of the problem. Right. Thank you. So don't do it. And yeah. the thing is, so it's like, so what? I'm supposed to while I'm giving a lecture on the you know George Washington's farewell address, I'm going to get a shootout yeah. with someone at the no, door. Thank like, you. Hard uh, pass, sir. I'm a I am a professor. I am uh, not trying to you know. Although I eat like, oh, wait, I have my dry erase markers. I've got my notes, I've got my pen, I've got my 45. Like, really, is 45. that what I'm prepping for class? It's, That's how little you know is about guns, too. You went with a 45. What is, I, think. Uh, what? I don't know. <laughs> At I don't least know. I didn't say like a rifle. I mean, like, give me I think I'd have a better chance with like an axe or a machete. Or <laughs> but like. <laughs> I hope our listeners my- send you some kind of long blade as a joke now. Okay, finally, <laughs> nobody knows more about New York uh, politics than my friend, Dr. Christina mm-hmm. Greer. So from New York City all the way throughout the rest of the state where I grew up in the sticks, I'm always trying to explain to people New York State is not what you think it is. What is New York State politically? Red. Every state is red with blue cities that could possibly turn the state blue or red, but right. every state is a red state with blue cities. And do you have enough blue cities? But when you look at the map, it's red, 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 red. It's a, it's a sprinkling of blueberries in a bowl of cherries. That's what it is. And so when you look at someone like a Kathy Hochul, who's running for the first time at the top of the ticket, you know that some people will yep. never vote for a woman at the top. Of the ticket. Cuomo in his first two runs for governor, you know, one with 30%. This, the last time he ran, he won with 24%. Kathy Hochul ran and won with 5%. She was running against a man who was an election denier, a January 6th supporter, and anti-choice. Avidly anti-choice. So, the fact that millions of New Yorkers voted for this man, and he has that kind of Yunkin vibe. Like, he doesn't look like he's totally, you know, he's he's young, he's like 45, 46 or something like that. So he doesn't, and don't forget, so is DeSantis, by the way. Yeah. Right, they're all the same age. So it's yeah. like, you know, it's not like, oh, young people are progressive. These guys have an agenda and they want to do it for the next 30 years. So he's running on these draconian policies, and you have these like hipster Brooklynites who are like, Oh, I voted for Zeldin. What in the world? You know, you have people who were just like, I'm not gonna vote. New York's blue, Kathy's fine. And it's like, this is the problem with our abysmal turnout, but also because we've been redistricted and gerrymandered, we see the Democrats might lose the house because of New York. Yeah. Like, let because the guy in. in my district won running on a crime wave in my Which county is that is not it's the sa- third safest county 
in right. America. And that's the main issue. I think that he probably won it because he scared the hell out of people to the crime. And I'm like, where? Where is that's it what, all? That's what Leldon, Lee Zeldin did. I mean, like everything was crime, crime, crime. You had people heckling Kathy Hochul when she would walk around. It's like crime. crime I saw that crime. video. They literally were just <laughs> yelling, chanting the word crime, which was such a right. weird thing to yell. Which, but I text. I don't know if you watch 30 Rock. I'm obsessed with 30 Rock. But there's there's a scene where Tracy Jordan on the show, Tracy Morgan, basically was like, oh, if you can't find something, you just yell. And like it just appears. That's right. what happens when I do it. And he just started screaming pants, pants. <laughs> so it's like I'm looking at these grown men yeah. heckling the governor of New York State, just screaming crime. And it's just like, listen, as Malcolm X reminds us, and I wrote this in the Times because I'm trying to normalize, you know, quoting Malcolm X in the New York Times. Mm. But it's like anything south of the Canadian border, the USA. Say that one more Wait. time. You were low on that. Anything south and of the. You know, well, you know, I like to do this intonations. Of my yeah, mind. yes, go ahead. Um, anything south of the Canadian border is the US South. Right. <laughs> so, like, we, you know, Mark Twain told tells us this all the time but like we try and make it seem like oh new york's so different no it's not you know my sister you know, i grew up in philly like you know pennsylvania called pensatucky right. like when you were outside of these blueberries which you know and i'm very clear they're parts of new york i would never go to not at two o'clock in the afternoon right it's like you might as well be in the deep south because you are you're in america and that's just what it is and it's red and it's scary just to be sometimes. clear you met upstate new york not New York City that you wouldn't go to. I mean, parts of Westchester where you see the F Biden signs. Like, yeah. we, I don't have oh, to yeah. go up to the Canadian border with New York State. No, like, come, to, I'm saying, come visit just, me. I'll introduce part, you to my neighbors. Hey, They'll love guess you. What? what about Staten Island? What about parts of Brooklyn? Yeah. Like, let's be clear. Nicole Maliotakis is going back to Congress and she represents Brooklyn and Staten Island. Well, to be clear, in those areas and in my area, we're talking less about the kind of, I'll just go ahead and generalize because I can, the rednecky rule uh, type of New Yorker. We're talking more about, uh, how do you say it? Uh, Italians and Irish. Okay, moving on. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, we're talking, but also we're talking about law enforcement, which is kind of scary oh, yeah. because they have like real... Yep. Oh, strong yeah. feelings about yep. who black people are. Oh, they run this county in terms of the yeah. political ideology, for sure. Okay, last question. Uh, d- the uh, health of democracy here at uh, post-midterm election, what, what would you say about our democracy? Um, I would say that yesterday's tallies, you know, looking at things, it's like, listen, we held against the tide to fight another day, but we are so not out the woods. Like, Got it. I hope Democrats don't take this as like, we got a victory lab. It's like, just because Democrats, you know, didn't get buried under this red tsunami, doesn't mean, I mean, look at the numbers, even the the Democrats who won, you know, or, you know, the incumbents who remained in office, you still have millions of people who are voting for insurrectionist election deniers, right? I mean, like, and there's still, you know, like the, the election denying incumbents, by and large, did really well. I mean, it should worry people that Warnock's in a runoff. It should worry people that, you know, Carrie Lake is sort of close to it or Bobert is, you know, undecided just yet or Johnson in Wisconsin got back into office. You know, like these things are worrisome, like Michigan. Sure, there's some bright spots. I don't want to be doom and gloom, but like the fact that New York is the reason why the Democrats might not have the House and we can just gear up for nothing but impeachment proceedings and just a waste of, of time and resources for the next year. That should be worried. Look at Texas. The doggone district in Evalde, they lost all those beautiful babies and they still voted for Greg Abbott, who says arm teachers. Oh, that's interesting because people talked about Texas voting for Greg Al- Abbott uh, despite Uvalde. But you're talking about the actual district where Uvalde is in. They vo- they went for him. They voted for Abbott in that particular. Wow. So and I don't know what the grief feels like. I've not been to Evalde at all. But I mean, the idea that. From what I read and what I saw of Beto articulating what we need to do to get guns under control in the state of Texas. And he's not saying take them away, but he's just like, listen, there are some protections we have to have. And it's not about taking a first year teacher who's 26 years old. And instead of giving her resources to educate children, you're making her take gun lessons like that's that's not a priority. You know, like we shouldn't have, you know, backpacks that are bulletproof. Like, let's think of other solutions. And. Texans said, no, thanks. Let's go with giving everybody guns. Because that is not a solution. Backpacks. I can't can't wait for, honestly, like, I, and I don't know if it'll ever happen, but like, police unions have to come out against it. At some point, police unions have to be like, enough is enough. Like, I don't want to be on the street just like in shootouts with teachers. Like, are you kidding? So, 
Yeah. We'll see. That. And then, you know, there's Wes Moore, third black man ever elected to governor. Still, you know, there are a lot of firsts. You know what happen. I say? Wes Moore for president. That's what I say. Let's slow down. Okay. Slow down. You don't care at all what I say. I mean, I care what you say, but like, you know, nope. let's see. Let's see if this if this guy knows how to how to lead a state before we start putting putting him in Iowa. Uh, and as you said on Twitter and everybody should be following her at DR underscore CM Greer tomorrow, we get to work as always. I share that right away because I, uh, well, I share. Oh, I, thought, <laughs> I thought you meant tomorrow as in November 11th, which is my favorite day of the year. Why? Veterans Day? <laughs> was like, veterans Day? I'm like, no, I'm not a veteran. And I do shout out to all the veterans. I do have great love and respect for veterans. But it's my favorite day because it's National Corduroy Day. One, 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 one. And it looks like corduroy. And you have to wear at least two pieces of corduroy to be compliant. But it is my favorite day of the year. I wait for it every year. And I tell my students all about it. And I literally have students from like 10, 15 years ago where I'm like, you took three, four, five of my classes. But they'll text me. It's like, happy corduroy day. And I'm like, is this the takeaway? Is this what you're well, remembering well, of all okay, the things well, we Well, now you've, you've, you've taken this segment that <laughs> much longer because I have society. to interrogate you on this. First of all, who has two pieces of corduroy, much less one? And what is your, sure, what is your fascination? Is what is your fascination? It, it feels luxurious. It's like the king's, what is it, the king's cord. I just wrote an op-ed about it. I'll send it to you. What? Um, <laughs> Yes. You know, I'm weird. And I like these things. I used to be part of the Corduroy Society of New York and uh, we would meet under um, the whale because, you know, the the width of Corduroy is called the whale. So we'd meet under the whale at the. Uh, oh, I didn't know that. Well, that's because that's the width. And I'm I'm more of a thin whale person. Um, but, you know, that's like the big debate. Uh, and so, yeah, the wow. Corduroy Society is my my big thing. Um, I so always, it's called the king's cloth. That's why. So some say the word corduroy is from the 17th century France, and it comes from the phrase "cord du Troy, the king's cloth. Every time I talk to you, I learn something and <laughs> something about you. Thank you very much for that. Thanks, for me. Dr. Christina Greer. Everybody, Chrissy Greer at dr underscore cm Greer. Go check out our podcast, The Blackest Questions. Everybody, your upcoming book. And so much more. So grateful that I had the opportunity to speak with her yesterday as well. Now it's time to get to my final guest today on part one of the Pete Dominic, stand up with Pete Dominic, midterm extravaganza bonanza. What did I decide I was calling it? Anyway, speaking of Christina Greer, it was because of her that I heard about the work of this young man and his organization, Next Gen. He is the Vice President of Communications for Next Gen America. He serves to oversee the implementation of a national strategy to increase the progressive power of young Americans in politics. Really interesting organization, Next Gen America, founded by uh, the billionaire Tom Steyer. Their goal is to empower young voters to engage in the political process and ensure our government is responsive to the largest and most diverse generation in American history. And he's very big on Twitter. Check him out at Antonio Erolano. Erolano. A-R-E-L-L-A-N-O. I'm never going to get it right. But he is great, and I think you're going to really like him. Here we go for the first time. All right, I've got him now, and I'm really excited to welcome him here to the show for the first time. Congratulations on all of your work, man. You, you've been calling it for like a month. Your credibility in your organization goes up. Congrats. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pete. You know, I was just looking at a Washington Post headline that said uh, from a couple of weeks ago that said Democrats should be worried about the youth vote. And I think they need to change that headline to Democrats should be grateful for the youth vote. So your organization has done some really great work, but it would seem that young people, certainly folks like you working in organizations, trying to get them to vote, trying to motivate them, had a very different point of view that a lot in the media wasn't reporting. What what did you see and what was being reported differently before we get to the results? Well, the difference is that we were actually talking to young people, right? We were, at, <laughs> uh, we were on the ground meeting with young people on yeah. college campuses, and we recognized the sentiment right away. Young people were outraged at the attacks against our democracy, at the attacks against abortion rights, um, at marriage equality, so many of these economic justice um, that they recognize uh, that a potential Republican rollback would jeopardize. And so they were ready and mobilized, eager to cast their ballot. And the national narrative was just not not tuning in. There's all these different organizations over the years that have worked hard to register young people to vote. And then it's another thing to get them to actually vote. 
Tell us a little bit about what worked. You were on tour with Bernie Sanders representing your organization, and you went to several different states. And I just want to know what works. You know, from Reno to, to Nevada to Texas to Philadelphia um, to Wisconsin to Michigan, what we were seeing on the ground is young people that wanted to be felt represented, felt heard. Um, and what they wanted is to make sure that we are continuing to advance progressive ideology. Young folks in America are incredibly progressive and are fighting for a, a future that recognizes um, that we need, uh, you know, health care access, including abortion rights, that we need immigration reform, that we need to tackle climate change, that the investments need to start keep coming in. Um, and so that's what we were hearing from young people that were frustrated that um, their perspectives were not really being heard. Additionally, you know, they know that Republicans continue to use intimidation tactics to try to uh, discourage them from participating. And they, you know, they they mess with the wrong generation. They mess with the wrong generation seems to be the case. Uh, I've read some of the, the data, some of your tweets uh, in the run up to to talking to you here. But what do you want to point out that that really people need to be paying attention to certainly the pundits much less the public and voters and and voting rights organizations and what state or what demographic what, what do you think uh is is something that is a real important piece of data a tell as a re, as as a result of how we voted the other night I mean, over 63 percent of young voters in America overwhelmingly voted for the Democratic ticket um, across the country. We had the second largest uh, voter participation in American history uh, outside of 2018. And what you're seeing here is that the youth vote is not a subsection of democracy. It is American democracy. There are 70 million young eligible voters in America, the largest eligible voting bloc, the most diverse eligible voting bloc in America. And people need to start coming to terms with that. The Gen Z and millennials are here to make sure that they're building a government that rep represents them and reflects them. It, were there, you mentioned a lot of issues that obviously young people, if they're paying any attention, care about or should. I don't want to should anybody, much less younger folks. But was there anything that really turned them out? A lot of people are focused on, uh, you know, it's easy to look at these issues that you think might be turning young folks out. But how much of an issue do you think the student loan debt relief played, for example? Yeah, absolutely. So we were on the ground at the University of Texas at Austin, literally the week after President Biden announced student debt relief. And we were talking to young voters that were registering to vote, energized and motivated by the fact that they're seeing their vote get counted and, and deliver results. So folks that turned out in record numbers in 2020, trying to keep climate change at the top of the congressional agenda, trying to prioritize student debt and organizing relentlessly for student debt relief, are seeing Democrats listen to them and, and Democrats deliver for them. That inspired and motivated them to continue to believe in American democracy and turn them out like never before. I think that the Democratic investment um, and also in marijuana, uh, the conversations that we're having now around marijuana, um, motivated young people like never before to, to recognize that the youth agenda is driving forward um, and delivering major wins. You know, you could talk about certain states where certainly we've come up short. I'm not going to blame it on young people. You might say that it's because of young people that we came as close as we did, progressive Democrats. And, and you can explain that to us. But I'm thinking of Wisconsin, where you were with Bernie Sanders. I'm thinking of Texas, where you're from. H what more needs to be done from the perspective of young folks? Do you feel satisfied with how much of an impact young voters made in those two states or pick anywhere else, Antonio? The reality, Pete, is that we're just getting started. What you saw today or this week, I'm sorry, um, is just a, 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 a the beginning of what you're going to see in 2024. Young people have shown now election after election. There is a clear pattern of youth increased participation. And so we're going to continue to invest. We are on the precipice of greatness. Young voters are starting to come to terms with that their vote delivers transformative change. Um, and we'll continue to uh, work around year round on mobilizing, organizing young voters. And right now, all eyes on Arizona, all eyes on Nevada, where youth vote will potentially deliver victories in those states. And then we are going all in and not stopping until we secure the Senate seat in Georgia. How do Democrats lose young people? How do Democrats and progressives necessarily you lose that long young vote? Is there a, I don't know, a policy or a, t a type of way to talk that Democrats take for granted or where they might have somebody interested and then turn them off and, and make them an, a, a young cynic? The reality is that we're dealing with the digital generation and 
civic engagement and politics needs to come to terms with that it needs to modernize and innovate its approach, whether it's um, how you do campaigns, right? We saw $1.6 billion in advertisement go predominantly into television. Nobody's watching television. We're watching and getting our news online and digital uh, platforms and social media. And so making sure that you're, that the investments are going into the right places, that you have an intentional targeted investment into young people is crucial. And so, um, you know, folks can talk about the youth vote all they want, but if they're not connecting, if they're not being relatable, if they're not digitally savvy and recognizing the power of a digital generation like next gen has, we've leveraged a massive influencer program to let the, the trusted messengers that already have millions of followers deliver political news and deliver political engagements and these calls to actions. If you're not doing that, then you're falling behind. Yeah, that is for sure. And I mean, I got, I, granted, I live in the suburbs, but I got, how many flyers did I get? Like young people don't look at a, at a they don't have a mailbox. They don't necessarily get a flyer. So it's got to be done on, on social media. How do you meet people where they're at? That's the question. I mean, it seems like a lot of it is through their phone. A lot of it is digital, but we, we're not giving up on field. Our infrastructure on the ground, on college campuses, on and off the campus is also crucial. One of the things that I'll tell you about, Pete, is we uh, connected um, also with athletes this cycle to make sure that athletes in college campuses, football players, uh, basketball players, were also encouraging their folks to come out and vote. And their fans did just that. It's important that we're tapping, like I said, and modernizing our, our, all of our resources to really engage people. Um, in an unprecedented way. So I guess the, the the last question is probably the big question in terms of, I mean, I guess we started here, but the polling w was off in many ways. Again, I think for the third cycle in a row, it was pretty off in, in, in many polls. And people always say, Antonio, it's because so much of the polling is done on a landline. It certainly was at my house. I don't even know why I have a landline. I'm embarrassed saying that to a young person like yourself. It's free. It's, it's cheaper to call Italy, okay, Antonio? Leave us alone. The point is, what, what what did the polling get wrong? What is the polling get wrong? Does the polling actually what people sometimes say it's a landline? Is it not polling young people is the question I'm trying to finally get to. You know, we conduct polls as well, but I think what's important is for us to recognize that um, in America, the attention span is so, so short and so small and things are constantly changing. I mean, the news cycle that we're currently in, and I mean, even a couple of months ago with the Mar-a-Lago news and FBI and so much happening all at once, um, it's, it's, and also then right after uh, the Supreme Court justice decision on Roe v. Wade, so many of these things are happening back to back at a massive speed. So when you have a poll that's conducted at three months before and it's going to influence your messaging for the remainder of the cycle, it doesn't take or encapsulate the things that happen post that polling. And so it's important that we keep our, our finger on the polls of the people, recognize what young people are actually talking about online, being responsive in real time. Um, and, and, and again, making them some, making them feel reflected in the process, making yeah. them feel like they are part of American democracy and not just a voting block that uh, talking heads on, on, na on national news talk about. Democrats, progressives of all ages, from all backgrounds, could not have done that without people like you and your organization, nextgenamerica.org. I look forward to getting to know you and your colleagues more and finding as many ways as we can to support young folks, uh, because you guys should have always a lot more say. And everything has always been my point of view. So thank you very much for joining me, and I look forward to talking to you again, man. Thank you, Pete, and stay tuned. We're just getting started. All right, there he goes, Antonio Erelano. I think I named, nailed it the last time here. Vice President of Communications at Next Gen America. Go say hi to him on Twitter. And thanks again to John Avalon, Chrissy Greer. Tomorrow, part two of the stand up Pete Dominic uh, midterm extravaganza, Bonanza, Shispanza. And I have Dahlia Lithwick. I've got Noel Kassler and Dave Daly. It's great. You're going to love it. I learned so much from all these guests. Can't do it without your support. Go sign up for a paid subscription right now at standupwithpete.com or patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. That's all I've got for you today. I'll talk to you tomorrow here on Stand Up. Be the change you want to see in the world. Don't use single-use plastic and try to stay mindful of the moment. Love you. Talk to you tomorrow. Bye-bye.
got to stand up. You got to stare the devil straight in the eyes. We got to let him know it's his time to go. See it clear and all you hear is a lie. Don't get up off of your butt. Get down off of your fence. Even if it ain't a very friendly audience. Well, they'll begin to listen when you start making sense. And you stand up. Stand our ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all. They had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws and since they weren't even sent, they knew. Change was gonna come before the change could begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We gotta let him know it's his time to go and make it clear when all we hear is a lie. See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up stand All right, up. we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up, you got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no wanton tribe Rise up, show up to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide it says stand up 